Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, just to say thank you to Robert and to Simon for inviting me here today to speak a bit about the UK's preparations for, for COP26. Uh, it's been fascinating hearing some reflections on COP25 and hearing about some of the challenges that the, the UK might face when we're hosting COP26 later this year. Um, so firstly, just COP25. So I think it's clear that COP25 was disappointing. But we shouldn't lose sight of the positives. 197 countries now come together annually to discuss climate change. And even five years ago, any such event would likely have been accompanied by media reports that this was all a big conspiracy. And we're not seeing that anymore. What we now see are urgent and amplified calls to action from governments, citizens, cities, and companies. However, we must allow luck to improve the outcome and the UK government is fully seized of the responsibility that the international community has placed upon us, along with Italy, our co-hosts, in hosting COP26. So why has the UK received such a vote of confidence from the international community? What is it about our track record that makes us suitable to host such a crucial event? It could be because the UK was the first country to pass a Climate Change Act and set up institutions like the Committee on Climate Change who give us independent advice on the subject. It could be because 400,000 people in the UK are employed in low-carbon jobs sector. Uh, to put that into context, that's more than the aerospace sector, for which we're widely known. Or it could be because this summer, uh, last summer now, uh, the UK became the first industrialised nation to put our net zero by 2050 target into law. Now, the official COP26 campaign, I can tell you, will launch in early February, when you'll hear much more about our detailed plans and priorities for the event. But I wanted to give you just uh, a broad overview of our, of our early plans and what the UK is, is looking to, to deliver. So we'll be ambitious in the negotiations, make every effort to ensure COP26 is a positive series of discussions. We'll look for improved ambition in countries' nationally determined contributions, and we welcome the news that 114 countries have now committed to lowering their emissions by, thinking through, by rethinking their NDCs this year. As, uh, as Fong said earlier, this uh, doesn't include some key players, but it does represent a 60% increase since September, so we're hopeful that momentum is building. Uh, just on NDCs, so there are some that argue that NDCs are only plans, and it's action that's required. But they are helpful, particularly for investors, in understanding where a country intends to go and what it's committing to. We're also going to use COP26 to provide a platform for the action that's happening right across the world to tackle climate change. Because we want to celebrate the positive work that governments, cities, and companies are doing, because that all adds up to a CO2 reduction plan. We'll be focusing on natural solutions for climate recovery. And there's a huge amount of discourse at the moment around biodiversity and nature-based solutions, particularly in this region with, um, with the biodiversity conference taking place in, in Kunming in October. And it's time to amplify those discussions by creating some transparency mechanisms around, around those issues. We'll also be looking at adaptation and resilience, which was mentioned earlier, including the work of bodies such as the Coalition for Disaster Resilient um, Investment, uh, of which the UK was a, a founding member. And underpinning all of this is finance. And some of you may have read Larry Fink's letter earlier this week, so he's the CEO of the world's largest investment firm, BlackRock. And he wrote to our investors to say that we can no longer treat climate change like a short-term blip, and that a fundamental shift is required in the way we think about climate and investment risk. And the UK has been thinking hard about this topic for, for the last couple of years. And the, bank, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, at the Global Task Force, which was referred to earlier, um, on disclosure of climate-related financial risk and how we provide information to shareholders. Uh, Mr. Carney will be working with Claire O'Neill, the COP26 president, and the rest of the team to amplify this work in, in Glasgow in November, and thinking through this not just in terms of, of risk, but also in terms of the increased returns one can receive from climate-affiliated investing. And we're starting to see a real increase in the amount of public and private institutions looking at these sustainable, lower carbon and climate-proof investments over the last couple of years. So I hope that gives you at least a, a broad flavour of the themes that the UK is looking to, to focus on during COP26. And we're very keen to continue the, the discussion both with Civic Exchange, Business Environment Council, its members, and all of you here, uh, and keep you updated on our plans throughout the year. So 2020 presents a golden opportunity for countries to, to show their commitment to achieving net zero by 
2015. And it's vital the world comes together if we're to stand a chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. Now, just finally, I'm told by people who have far more experience than I do in this area that very often a good, a good cop follows a bad one. For every Copenhagen, you get a, you get a Paris. And while we don't just want to look at historical indicators, there's lots of work to be done. Um, I can assure you that the UK will be working tirelessly with our international partners, including the government of Hong Kong here, um, and all of you in the room, to ensure that Glasgow in November is a real success. Thank you very much.